When I was um, when I was growing up in Hinton, over in Summers County, um, we lived in different houses. And at one point, when I was in grade school, I think I was probably about 11 years old. We lived on the corner of Fourth Avenue and James Street, right in the middle of town. And the cool thing about Hinton back in that day, they don't do it anymore, but back in the day, they would block off when it snowed. Are you from Hinton? No. You. Oh, you, I just saw a look on your face. It was like, who is? You from Hinton? Anyway, back in the day, when it snowed, they would block off the street. 4th Avenue and James Street, right at the corner where my parents' house was, right on the corner of 4th Avenue and James Street. If you continued up James Street, the next hill right across from the corner of our house, well, it was a hill. It was a big hill, that whole block. And then up above that, the next block was an even steeper hill. And the city hall would block off the streets along James Street and 4th Avenue so that no cars could come through there. And all the kids all over Hinton, all over Summers County would come with their sleds. And they would all gather at the top of James Street, really up on Fifth Avenue, at the top of the hill. And they would build a fire up there in a big old barrel, and a fire would be going, and people would just ride their sleds all night. It was awesome. And if you went up to Fifth Avenue, and you went on up the next street that was even steeper, most people didn't even dare to do that because just coming off from Fifth Avenue, you would go so fast that you would go, you would come down that block, you would go the next block and the next block. You could go three whole blocks before you stopped, even if you had a cheap old sled like I did. So it was just really awesome. And uh, I remember one winter, it was a good snow, and they blocked off the streets, and we were all up there sledding down that hill, and we'd made several runs. And, you know, after a while, when, you, when you're doing something cool, after a while, it kind of wears off, and you need something a little more exciting. So you got to step it up a little bit. So we're like, all right, we've been going down this hill. We got it now. It's fast, but it's kind of getting old. So me and my buddy, Gary Keaton, we decided... Let's double. Let's both get on the same sled and go down the hill and see what happens. It's like, yeah, awesome. So Gary Keaton and I get on this sled at the top of James Street. And he lays down and I lay down on top of him. Now we got the old sled, the wooden sled with the metal runners that you can actually steer. You know what I'm talking about? They're the bomb. <laughs> Sherry knows. I bet they had those in Monroe County too, didn't they? Neil Hutchison used to sled on an old Coca-Cola sign, but that's another story. She knows him. So we're up to the top. Gary Keaton gets on the bottom. I get on top. We both got our hands on the steering thing, whatever it's called, and we take off, and we're like, yeah, it's going to be awesome. And we're going down the hill about a quarter of the way down. We're picking up speed, and we're like, yeah, this is the greatest idea we've ever had in our life. Halfway down the hill, we're booking, man. We're picking up speed. But then something starts to happen. The sled kind of starts veering off just a little bit to the right. Well, then I thought, well, I'm the leader. i got to take control of this thing and steer this thing the way it needs to go. So no problem. I grab the steering thing, and I go to move it back to the left. But guess who thought he was the leader? Gary Keaton thought he was the leader. So he grabbed it, and when he felt me trying to steer it he fought against me he tried to go the other way so now we're three quarters of the way down the hill our sled is rapidly moving to the right and we're fighting over who's in charge we're fighting over who's steering did i tell you right on the corner right in front of my mom and dad's house is a big old stop sign did i tell you that are you are you starting to see what's about to happen we're flying down this hill. We're fighting. We didn't decide who was in charge before we started down the hill. For three quarters of the way down the hill, it was the greatest ride ever. But then as we fought over the steering, we veered to the right. And when we hit the bottom of that hill, we shot across that intersection. And there was a little curb about that high right in front of that stop sign. Boy, we hit that thing and it shot us up in the air. And it sent us sideways. 
and we broadside hit that stop sign. Bam! Now, I don't know how we kept from dying. I don't know how we kept from getting knocked out. I don't know how we kept from getting any broken bones. God just must have been watching over us. But when we flew off that thing sideways, Gary Keaton (laughs) hit that stop sign pole with his side and his ribs. And I hit it with my leg. And we're just laying there in excruciating pain. And he's holding his side. And I'm holding my leg. I still don't know how we didn't break any bones. But that night it was painful. And for several days after that, I had this huge bruise on my leg where I hit that stop sign. And Gary had this huge bruise on his side where we hit that stop sign. It was the greatest ride ever until we hit that sudden stop. Are y'all with me? See, what happened to us was stubborn pride. My stubborn pride had to do it my way, and Gary Keaton's stubborn pride had to do it his way, and because of both of our stubborn pride, the greatest ride of our life was destined to hit this sudden stop. And when you hit a sudden stop in the middle of your ride, it's painful. It hurts. I want to talk to you tonight about stubborn pride. Because what happens is as we go through this life, we, get, we start trying to fill up our life with what makes us feel good and what fulfills us and what's going to make us important, what's going to get other people to notice us, notice us so we'll feel like somebody. And because we're born without this relationship with God, which tells us the right direction to go, we're born without that, we start trying to figure it out on our own. And we start trying to respond to the things that life throws at us our way. And we start trying to live our life by our own stubborn pride. And because we don't have a relationship with God, we're going to veer off in the wrong direction from time to time. And if somebody doesn't intervene, if God doesn't get our attention, we're going to keep veering off away from His plan for our lives. And so our stubborn pride gets us heading down a direction that it's so fun. Listen, you hear me? Stubborn pride. Doing things the way it feels good to me right now. It ends with a sudden stop. And what you think is the greatest ride of your life all of a sudden becomes painful and uncomfortable and unpleasant. Oh, hello? Anybody with me? Anybody relating yet? So stubborn pride. And what you need is for God to intervene. And what you need to be able to do is to start listening to His voice and doing things His way and letting Him steer your life. And until you give that over to God and enter into a a relationship with Him and understand who He wants to be in your life and what He has planned for your life, then you're going to keep doing things your own way based on your own stubborn pride. And it's going to keep ending with a sudden stop. Just when you thought it was getting fun, all of a sudden, it catches up with you. So because I don't want to see that happen in your life anymore. I don't want to see it happen in my life anymore. More importantly, because God has something better for you than that. God has something way better for you than your own stubborn pride will ever figure out without Him. And so I want to share with you the next three weeks. I want to share with you three symptoms of pride. Because if you can become aware, you need to become aware of what the symptoms of pride are. Because if you can recognize the symptoms coming out in your life, you can recognize, wait a minute, that's a pride. That's my stubborn pride. And I don't need to listen to that. I'm going with God. So it's important, the more you become aware of the symptoms of stubborn pride, the more you'll be able to recognize it in your life and stop it and move in the right direction when it happens. So I just want to tell you one tonight. I'm going to talk about one each night. The first one tonight I'm going to show you, if you have your Bibles, what are the symptoms of stubborn pride? For those of you who are tired of your pride sending you into the stop sign. For those who want to know, take your Bibles if you got them. If you got your Bible, I'm looking in the Old Testament tonight. 
That's the first part of the Bible. And I'm looking in a book called 1 Samuel, which is near the front part. If you got this Bible right here, it's on page 330. If you got one of the images Bible that some of the ladies have, I'm not sure what page it's on, but it's 1 Samuel. Who's got one of those image Bibles? Yeah. All right. One of you finds it, let the other ones know what page it's on. 1 Samuel. And um, what are the symptoms of stubborn pride? Anybody want to know? Anybody interested? Or you just want to go keep doing it the way you're doing it? Who's interested? You sure? All right. 1 Samuel, chapter 4. Here's what it says. Now, I'm about to read to you 11 verses. Hang with me for 11 verses. And this is a story, a true story about Israel, God's people, back in the Old Testament. A story about how they listened to their stubborn pride instead of God and got themselves into a situation that ended with a sudden stop. And what we can do tonight, what I want you to understand, some of y'all that haven't been in chapel much or haven't been here yet at all until tonight, we don't want to just read the Bible to you and it has nothing to do with your life. We want you to see that God's Word has everything to do with you right now and has something to do with teenagers. I want to show you tonight what these 11 verses have to do with you. Okay? And you can learn from Israel's mistake how Israel at stubborn pride bring them to a sudden stop. Now let's listen and let's look at what happened with Israel and see if you can see some things that Israel did that maybe you've done in your life or maybe I've done in my life. Or maybe you're doing right now and it's taking you off course and you're about to go the wrong way. Or you went the wrong way and you're trying to figure out what happened. See if you can hear something in this story that has something to do with you. You ready, Zach? All right, here we go. It says, Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. That's the name of a place. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. Now, do y'all have any idea who the Philistines are? Philistines? Yeah? Do you ever, you ever hear the story about David and Goliath? Yeah. Goliath was a Philistine. The Philistines back in these days, they were the bomb, man. They, they were the Mac Daddy warriors of this time in the Old Testament. And nobody wanted to mess with them. But Israel, you've got to understand, at this point in time, God has brought Israel out of slavery. And God is leading Israel through the land. And He's given them a land. And they are coming up against people that want to fight with them, and God has given them power, and God has given them victory. God is raising them up, saying, these are my people I want to use to tell the whole world who I am. And so the Israelites are going from slavery to becoming tough and respected. And they're moving through the land, and now they're getting kind of, they're getting kind of cocky, they're getting kind of prideful and arrogant, and they're like, bring on the Philistines, yo. Ain't nobody got nothing for us because we got God. Bring on the Philistines. So they're ready to go up against the big guys and show them who's boss and show them there's a new boss in town. So that's their attitude. That's what's been happening. So they go out and it says the Israelites camped there. I told you that. Verse 2, the Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was, watch this, defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to the camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today, before the Philistines? You ever been in a situation where you thought, I have a decision to make, and this is what I'm going to do, and I know it's the right thing. And then it turns out all wrong? Anybody ever do that? Well, the Israelites were like, man, we got God. Can't nobody touch us. We're going to go do this. And then they hit a stop sign. 
And God lets them get their butts kicked. God lets them get whipped. All right? And they're like, what? And look at the first thing they say. What do they say? Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today? Remember that. And it says, let us bring the ark. Now the ark is this thing called the ark of the covenant. And it's basically this fancy box that God told them to carry around with them as they moved through the land. And it represented His presence. And there was stuff they put in that box that reminded them of awesome things that God had done so they wouldn't forget. And they're supposed to carry this thing called this ark. It was a big box. So they get whipped. They're like, what's up? And then they're like, I know, let's get the ark. It represents God's presence with us, and let's take it. And then they say that it may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Now, now it says, so the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the ark of the covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim, that's angels, and Eli's two sons, now listen to this, these two guys, Hophni and Phinehas, weird names. They were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Guess who Hophni and Phinehas were? Phinehas. Aren't you glad that's not your name? They were two preacher's kids. Now, I'm a preacher's kid, and you've heard maybe... When I was growing up, it was rumored that preacher's kids were some of the worst ones. And I will testify to you that, in my case, that was true. But God got a hold of my life and changed me. But these two guys were some messed up, rebellious preacher's kids their dad was the priest the high priest and they were punks man they thought you know they were taking advantage of the privileges their dad had and they were doing all kinds of stuff and the israelites were like these guys are bums priest man you need to do something about your kids but he was letting his kids run wild so that's who these guys are you need to remember that too these guys are acting one way part of the time but when God's convenient they're saying they're Christians hello they are acting one way when God's convenient for them they're acting like they're Christians they're hanging around where God is worshiped but the rest of the time they act like they don't even know God so that's these two guys so then it says in verse Five. When the ark of the Lord's covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. Guess what? The Philistines were afraid because they had been hearing that God is real and guess what he's doing? He's raising up this nation and they're, they're moving through the land, and God is with them. And when the Philistines heard the whole nation of Israel making this big scene, shouting so loud that the ground shook, their whole nation was shouting about how they had God with them. And it scared the Philistines because they're like, dude, wait a minute, if they got God, we've been hearing about this God. We don't have a chance. But then here's what they said. It says, a God has come into the camp. A God. They didn't know who he was, but they knew he was bad, as in good. So they said, we're in trouble. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. And then they say, be strong. I'm going to show you what this right here has to do with some of us. Be strong, Philistines. Be men. Or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. You know what the Philistines were saying? They were saying basically this. Yeah, we heard about your God. And yeah, we know He's real. But we like the way we are. And we don't want your God. And we would rather die rebelling against God. We would rather die being angry at your God than to follow your God. So the Philistines were so hard-hearted. They were so hard that they basically were like, if following God means we've got to change, we'd rather fight against Him and die. 
Have you ever met anybody like that? Don't say anybody's name. Have you ever been like that? A lot of times that's the struggle that we go through is we know God's real. We know He's got a better plan than what we're doing. We know what His way is way better than our stubborn pride, but we just got too much of that pride. And we would rather keep doing things our way and keep running into stop signs than to admit God's got a better way. So that's who these people were, man. They were, they were hardcore. And then it says, so the Philistines fought and the Israelites... Now you've got to be thinking now, surely God's going to let Israel win. Especially since the Philistines don't even know God or want to know Him. Look what happens. The Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated. And every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great and Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured. Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. They died. True story. And just because somebody calls himself a Christian doesn't mean they're really listening to God. Doesn't mean they really know Him. It's just a name they wear. A real Christ follower listens to God and follows His way. Not perfectly all the time, but consistently in their life. Now I read all that to show you the whole story. Now I want you to go back with me to the first few verses. And let me show you this first symptom that you can think about as you leave tonight. The first symptom. You can see how they got prideful and how they ran into the sudden stop sign, right? You see that. You can see probably some things in your life that are sort of similar to what Israel did in my life. Now let's look at the symptoms that if they would have been paying attention, they could have stopped it before it happened. The first symptom is hastiness. Everybody say hastiness. Do you know what it means to be hasty? Somebody tell me what it means to be hasty. What's it mean? Huh? Selfish? Yeah, it is a selfish act. But what else does it mean to be hasty? What's it mean to be hasty? If Coach Ryan was coaching you, and you're bringing the ball down the court, and you try to force something that's not there, are you with me? And you try to make a pass that you don't have, yeah, he's going to get mad because he wants the very best out of you, right? But that's a hasty thing. You try to take the ball into your own hands with your own stubborn pride and make something happen that's not there. That's hasty, right? Are you with me? All right. That's hasty. Hasty is when you try to do something in your own stubborn pride that's really not the best thing to do. And you try to fix things yourself instead of waiting on God. Instead of listening to what God has to say. And here's where I see this. It says in verse 1, look at that. The Israelites went out. Guess what I don't see in that verse? I don't see the words, God told Israel to go out. You hear me? All I see is, in other parts of the Bible, I read where God tells Israel, go and do this. I read where God tells Israel, I'm going to give you this land, I want you to go in and fight for it. And I'm going to give you the victory. There's one thing different here that I don't see compared to other stories in the Bible. God never tells them to go. God never tells them in this, in this scripture to go fight the Philistines and take, take them over. He never tells them. But they get hasty and they try to run ahead of God like they could. They're, they're thinking, man... God's not telling us to go do this, but I know this is, this, this is what we need to do. What are you waiting on, God? You ever been there in your life? Man, I want this. Man, I talked to, talk to some of y'all, and I know some of y'all have been there. What is God waiting on? I've been here this long. When am I going to get out of this program? I've been waiting on God to fix my home life. When is God going to change it? I've been waiting on you, God, to do this and this and this in my life. I've been taking this test trying to pass it. And I have to keep coming back. I've got to do this pre-test. And I've got to take this test again. I get my GED. 
but I didn't pass it. Now I got to come. What are you waiting on, God? All kinds of different situations. Some of y'all are with me. All kinds of different situations where we feel like God is not moving fast enough. Staff, you ever felt that way? It ain't just the kids, right? And what happens if we're not careful, we'll let our stubborn pride step in the way instead of waiting on God and learning what He's wanting to teach us through our testing. We want to take matters into our own hands and we get hasty and we try to move ahead of God and say, God, I don't know what you're waiting on, but I'm doing this and I'm going to deal with this. That's when we start to veer off and we start to head for a problem. And that's when we're going to get embarrassed because our stubborn pride. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. When we get hasty, it's a symptom of pride. It's like if you've ever been on a road trip, I don't know if, if all of y'all have, but I've been on lots of road trips where I've got to travel with people. I've had ministry teams in the past that I travel around up and down the country with and around and sometimes we got to take more than one car to get all of us where we're going and sometimes when you're on a road trip different people drive at different speeds right and different people drive with different styles and imagine that you're on a road trip and you know where you're going and you don't nobody has a GPS you know where you're going and you're leading all right and you're driving down the road and you're thinking, yep, we got plenty of time and exit number 22. That's our exit. When we get to exit number 22, I'm going to put on my turn signal and everybody I'm leading is going to follow me off that exit. And we're going to be there in plenty of time and it's all going to be good. And you're cruising down the highway, exit number 19, and you're like, 20, 20, 20, three more exits. And then all of a sudden, one of the people behind you they're sitting there trying, driving behind you going grief man christmas is coming soon i mean grandma was slow but come on can't you can't you go a little faster i tell you what i'm going to do i'm going to i'm going to take matters into my hands and i'm going to go around my leader and i'm going to speed this thing up and so all of a sudden you're like exit 19 and all of a sudden somebody in your crew goes Poom! right past you and that's good, except now you're at exit 20, and they're way ahead of you. And they're leaving you behind because they got hasty because they didn't think you were going fast enough. And so they, they're going, and now you're thinking, oh, snap. If I don't, I'm going to have to catch up with them and drive reckless and endanger everybody in my car to catch up with them because they don't know I was getting ready to turn off on exit 21. Was it 21? 22, my bad. You're with me. You are listening. They're going to turn off. They're going to go right past it. Now I've got to run them down. Who knows how long it's going to be before we come to exit 23 or 24 or 25, how many miles we're going to have to go. Then I'm going to have to get their attention. And then when we finally get off the road, then we're going to have to find an exit and get turned around. And then we're going to have to come all the way back. We were having plenty of time. Now we're going to be late. Because somebody got hasty because they couldn't see the big picture. They didn't know what I know. See, that's the way we do with God. When life isn't working out exactly the way we had in mind, and when our, when our stubborn pride has taken us, when our stubborn pride has taken us in a direction that's not going to turn out good, and sometimes God will put people in our life that start saying, wait a minute, listen, wake up. Don't go that way. It's going to end wrong. And we're like, shut up. I know what I'm doing. And we don't listen to God and we say, here's what I'm going to do. God's not fixing this the way I want it, when I want it. So I'm going to do it my way. And we get hasty and we try to move ahead of God and that's when we get in trouble. And it doesn't turn out good. Why? Because God knows something we don't know. That's what makes Him God. God sees the big picture. He knew you before you were born. He knows you now. And He knows what's coming up later in your life. 
And He knows exactly what He's doing to get you ready for that. And so, when you really want to have victory in your life, it really comes when you begin to, listen to this, trust God. When you begin to trust that God knows more than me, and even though I don't understand what God's doing, I'm going to be faithful to Him and just do things His way. It's going to pay off. You're not always going to understand what He's letting you go through or what He's taking you through, but when you learn you can trust God, that's when your life's about to turn around. So, what I want to invite you to do tonight is to quit trying to steer your own sled. Don't you think it's time? Whoever of you that you, God's speaking to you and you know it tonight. That's who I'm talking to. Don't you think it's time you let God steer? Are you tired of your stubborn pride ending you up in places that are not what you planned on? Are you tired of your stubborn pride taking you where you didn't really want to go? See, pride will take you places you never wanted to go. It will take you farther than you ever planned on going and it will keep you longer than you planned to stay. So if you're tired of your stubborn pride doing that to you, and my stubborn pride has done that to me in my life too, I'm not talking down to you, I'm just delivering God's message to you. It applies to me too. If you're tired of that, and you're ready to trust God instead of following your stubborn pride, then I just want to give you a few minutes tonight to pray and talk to God. Ask Him to forgive you and ask Him to change you. And tell Him you're ready to do things His way if He'll show you how. Matt's going to come back up here and start strumming the guitar. He didn't know that, but now he does. And this is just your opportunity to pray. And talk to God. And I want to tell you this right before, right before we finish up. Hear this. It is not about what somebody else in your cottage says you need to do. They're not going to stand before God with you one day and take up for you. They're not going to go to your court hearing with you. They're going to set you up and get you in trouble and make themselves look good and make you look like a fool. And they're not going to court with you. And it's time to forget about what somebody else says you need to do. And it's time to start trusting God and do what you know is right. It's not about what somebody else says is right and cool. Stubborn pride will cause you to try to please everybody else and keep getting yourself in trouble. And if you're tired of trying to please everybody else so you can make yourself look good in front of people who don't even care about you, then I'm inviting you tonight to lay that down. God's inviting you tonight to lay that down. And just to simply say to him, God, I'm tired of trying to please other people that don't care about me. And I need your help because when I go back to the cottage, it's going to be hard to live for you. But that's what I want to do. I'm inviting you tonight to just tell God, I'm tired of doing it that way. I want to do it your way. Please help me. And then start trusting what he says to you. If that's what you know you need, and that's what you're ready to do, then as Matt begins to play, I'm going to invite you. There's a space down here. If you feel like you need to get out of your chairs and have a place to pray, and listen very carefully to what I'm saying. This is you and God. I want to ask you tonight, don't come up here and hug all over each other. Sometimes that's appropriate. Tonight I'm asking you to do something different. Leave each other alone. If somebody comes up here and pray, leave them alone. Let them talk to God. 
If you come up here, you come to talk to God between you and God. If you feel like, I'd just rather talk to God right here in my seat, that's okay too. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. But God might be leading some of you just to get out and get some space and get up here where you can pray. So as Matt begins to sing, I want to invite you to come and talk to God about what He has said to you tonight.